Well, we started and we stopped and we started and we stopped. And finally, finally, the three of us are healthy and here and here to talk about what I think is one of the most important conversations that we'll ever have in terms of helping you, whether you're a first time investor or you've been around for decades, but a, a way to process this information about performance from the past. Because I think there's a lot of, I won't call it confusion, but indecision. How important is that past information performance I'm talking about here? And before we start looking at the quilt charts, which is one of the things that at least I'm going to talk about today, and Chris Pedersen and Daryl Balls, they're going to be talking about some other tables that uh, and charts that we think are important for you to understand how investing works. So uh, what I would like to do is, because we've talked about this, guys, and Chris, let's start with you. And as far as you're concerned, how do you see the past performance, how important it is, how far back we should go, how much we should count on it? It's your turn. Take it away. Well, it's the only it's the only thing we have to guide us when we think about the future. And that's true in a in a lot of in pretty much every aspect of our life, right? You wake up in the morning and you you want to know how the day is going to go. Your best predictor is the life experience you have for all the days that came before. And although it's true that we have no idea what markets will do today or tomorrow or five days from now or even a year from now, the the best indication we have or the best hint we have at what might happen is the past. And the more of that we have, the longer the history the more confidence I tend to have in it. Uh, so, uh, you know, we we do everything we can here to try and go back as far as we can. Unfortunately, some of the asset classes, some of the geographies, we don't have histories that go back more than 20, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. And, and so, and that sounds like a lot, right? That sounds like, oh, that's a huge amount of time. But uh, in the world of personal finance, long-term trends can take almost an investor lifetime to show up. <clears throat> so uh, where possible, we, we really like to go all the way back to 1928. And uh, if somebody looks at history of 10 or 20 years and tries to draw meaningful conclusions, uh, that's, that's tough. Yeah. Well, and and just out of curiosity, Chris, um, let's just talk about the bad times, the big losses. Um, do you think that there's anything unique about big losses of a hundred years ago compared to what you would expect big losses to be like today? Well, the the um, the personal finance industry, if you if you look at the returns. They do largely look random. Uh, they look they look random around. Uh, you know, there's a certain reversion to a mean, and there are certain long term trends that map to the evolution of the economy, to the growth of the economy, to growth of earnings. So th there are underlying drivers of where we started and where we get to that are fundamental and are financial, but. Any given day's return, any given year's return is random. And random processes, the longer you have a set of data, the more extreme the outliers will be. Yeah. So on the one hand, people will say, well, the Great, the Great Depression, that's a once in a hundred year, once in 200 year experience. It won't happen again. Well, probably within a hundred to 200 years, something that bad will happen again. And and uh, you know, you never know when you're going to have that once in a thousand year experience, yeah. too, right? I mean, it it's random. You just don't know. So the that doesn't mean you should plan your life around that rare experience because its probability is very, very low. But it also means you can't guarantee anything. You can't guarantee that it won't happen. That there won't be something that's an outlier. The good news is for most of us. 
for most of us over a period of five years, 10 years, even a lifetime, we will, we will see behavior in the markets that matches uh, the historical mean and median kinds of behaviors we've had in the past. And that suggests we should be optimists that the outcome is probably going to be in our favor. Uh, we're going to very likely see a return in equities that's greater than inflation that gives us the real chance to multiply the power, the buying power of the investments that we make there. Mm -hmm. And yes, we'll have to tolerate volatility to get it. Well, we'll see our balances go up and down, but that's why Jack Bogle said, buy right, hold tight and don't peak. Um, you know, the less you peak, the happier you will be with the returns that you get because you won't spend as much time in the emotions of the day. You'll spend more time working and living and enjoying life and then enjoying the fruits of that prudent investing later in life. That's great. And Daryl, what's your philosophy about looking backwards to look forward? Well, I think I don't think you can predict future returns. Uh, you can't tell what's going to happen today, tomorrow, next week, next year, even even in the next decade. I don't think you can use past returns to predict what's going to happen. I agree with what Chris has said in large part, um, but I think the the value in in looking at past uh, data is to get a, a sense for volatility, to get a sense how different types of uh, investments or portfolios can perform under a given sequence of returns that we know happened. Um, and, and that gives you uh, confidence in what you might be able to expect in the future. Um, whether or not the, the economic situation is such that you could have another Great Depression, I, I don't know. I believe they have. I believe they think they can avoid that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that they can. Maybe they can, but that doesn't mean that you can avoid uh, volatility on the downside. Uh, as great as that, all you need you can think of several scenarios that have nothing to do with the kinds of things that caused the Great Depression that could cause similar losses. Um, I. Just to name name one or two of them, you know, you can think, well, what happens if, what would happen if if India and Pakistan went nuclear? That and they had, a, if they had a reasonable nuclear exchange, that would probably shake up a lot of people because you don't know what's going to happen. How far is it going to go? I'm sure there are others, not to scare everybody, but uh, it, it could happen. It yeah. could happen. I believe it could happen. I hope it doesn't. Um, or if it does, at least it's 30 years out. So, so I won't have to after we die, after so we don't I, have to face. I don't it. have to worry about it. Yeah, <laughs> but but you do have to be aware of it. Black swans yeah. happen, yeah. and and so um, I don't think I don't think when people talk about black swans, I don't think they. I think a lot of times when when they say, "Well, this is a black swan," I I don't think that's a black swan. I don't think you've seen a black swan yet. So. Um, the financial crisis in 2008, I don't think was a black swan. So, well, and I, I my, that's my opinion. But uh, no, I think that's for what it's worth. That's no, it's worth a lot. And, and uh, my view is that the best view I have of the future is the past. And I believe it will look just like the path, the past, with the exception of one thing. I have no idea what the sequence of returns will be, but uh, what I want to talk about today, uh, the quilt charts that uh, that you you put together, Daryl, uh, gives me an opportunity to look at the past, and then lo and behold, it it turns out that the future has similar kinds of volatility, but it's never the same story, and so like you say. Whatever that driving force is that's going to cause the market to go down, uh, it, it's going to be in some way different from the past. And we forget quite easily that between about 2000 and 2002, the NASDAQ 
the high tech companies that have recently been in part responsible for this huge market run lost 80% of their value. I think Microsoft went from uh, well over 100 uh, down to about 10 or $11 a share. So uh, even the, the, the giants took a hit, and that's the kind of volatility we've seen in the past. The one thing that may be different, theoretically, I guess, uh, is that we had very few people investing in the stock market. And, and uh, today we have a lot of people investing. So the liquidity today is much higher, which might suggest that there is um, uh, going to be less volatility because those from 1929 to 1938, the actual return for that 10 years was virtually the same for 1929 to 38 as it was from 2000 to 2009 in the S&P 500. But what it was back from 29 to 38 was a wild bucking bronco that, that really was just out of control. And yet the end result virtually the same. So uh, I'm going with the future is going to look like the past, up and down and all around. And I think that what, Daryl, you put together and putting together this, this quilt chart, and and you made a point before we got started. You did not invent the quilt chart. We all agree to that. But I think you put it together in a way that it makes more sense as a learning tool than any other quilt chart that I have seen. So if you guys will give me a chance to share some of my uh, my slides. Now, while we're going to talk about the, uh, uh, the, the new quilt charts that Daryl has put together and why they so are so important, I want to start with what we used to think, or I used to think was the most important thing to show people, and that was the historical returns of the different equity asset classes. And I think it surprises most investors when they find that the S&P 500, which is considered to be the benchmark, and most people think of it as the, the what they're trying to match in terms of a return, that over the last 96 years, it's hypothetical, of course, because there wasn't an S&P 500 96 years ago, but the academics have put it together and they show you that at a 10% compound rate of return, it turned $100 into almost 950000 But the other equity asset classes that are very different than the S&P 500 in terms of how high they go, how low they go, and when they go, that particular equity asset class compounded at 11% and created a $2.3 million value at the end of this 96 years. And then with small cap blend, it was an 11.9% compound rate of return. That turned that $100 into about $4.9 million. And finally, what we call the gold ring of asset equity asset classes, small cap value, compounded at 13.2, turning that $100 into about $14.8 million. Now, I thought this table, and plus this table shows the best one-year return and the worst one-year return, and that that would give people a sense of the differences of these different, very different equity asset classes. And of course, we also show on this table the impact of matching 25% each, building a portfolio that we affectionately call, call the U.S. four fund strategy that made 11.8%. So it made a, almost a 2% better year return uh, over the S&P 500 over that 96 years. Now, that's really impressive, but the risk was higher. The volatility was higher. 
And here, what Daryl has produced with that with that data is what would you have had if you had half of your money in small value and half of your money in large value? And that compound rate of return is 12.3. And if you had half of the money in the S&P 500 and half of the money in uh, small cap value, it turned the $100 into over four point. $8 million, a huge advantage uh, over the S&P 500. So my belief was that this information was going to give people a good sense of the premium. But what it doesn't do, and what I think that, and I'm going to move forward here, this quilt chart that Daryl put together, is is I th I really think is one of the most powerful teaching tools I know, and the reason I love it is because it takes those same four equity asset classes, and it creates the history of it one year at a time. We can start up here in 1928. We can look at it one year at a time. We can see how did the S&P 500 do? It's in red. We can see how did small cap blend do? It's in green. How did the small cap value do? It's in blue. And how did large cap value do? It's in purple. And then what Daryl did that I thought was masterful to think to do this was to add one more and that is the four fund strategy. What if you just took 25% each of these four equity asset classes? And the one thing that I see right there is that it is in the middle. It is in the middle for most of that 10-year period. And as you go into the next 10-year period, it is in the middle there again. And it is in the middle in the next 10 and the next 10. And you got the idea the four fund strategy, because it is the average of those four equity asset classes, is what you get. Now, what people don't know, unless they look carefully, and I know these are small numbers, but you'll have time to look at them carefully later, what you're going to see is in each box in each year, like let's just look here at 1934. Small cap blend in 1934 was up 16.6% .6 for the year. The four fund strategy was down 0.2. But look down here at the bottom. Large cap value was down 8.7. Small cap value was down 6.6. The S&P 500, I'm sorry, 6.2. S&P 500 down 1.1. ,1. And yet here was one asset class that was doing just fine. And isn't this what we know about diversification? It's not like all of these equity classes go up and down together. We don't know when they're going to go up and they're going to go down. But all you have to do is to look at the mix of colors and when you find blue at the top and when you find blue at the bottom and the S&P red at the top and the bottom, you get a sense how difficult it is, in fact, impossible not only to know what's going to happen the next year, but how is what's going to happen the next? In fact, if we look at 1940 here through 1945, the S&P 500 was the worst producing asset class for all six of those years. And how do you think people would have felt about the S&P 500 at that time? Well, they'd be thinking it's not as hot as we were told it was going to be. And boy, did that happen. After that huge run the S and P 500 had back in the in in the in the 90s, it had huge returns. It didn't always put them at the top, but it, they were great returns overall, regardless of how they did compared to others. But all that great performance they had during that period of 1990 through uh, let's say 99. That all came back to revert to the mean, as I think Daryl was talking about earlier. Things get back to normal. And what is normal? Normal is small cap value is the best producing equity asset class. And it was from 2000 to 2004. And the S&P 500 was the worst. Now, the worst doesn't make it bad. 
In fact, plenty of people can put away lots of money, and if all they ever owned was the S&P 500, I am sure they'd be fine. But this, this quilt chart, it allows us, I think, to start to understand how unpredictable the market is. And yet I said the future is going to look just like the past. And all I mean by that is if you take any particular 10-year period, and we're going to see some plus from, from 1998 to 2007, we saw we saw the top one up 28 point something here, 6 and 98, then 22.9, then 19.7, minus 8.8. Up 67.1, up 23 point. We're going to see those years similar to that in the past. So there's nothing new that happened in the last 20 years that hadn't happened before. And that if we are going to be a long-term investor, th th this, this whole thing about staying the course, you know, Chris says, don't peak. Absolutely. Sleep tight and don't peak. This, but the same, that, that is another way that John Bogle said, stay the course, which we all agree is going to give you the highest probability of long-term success. And yet this is what you have to stay the course with. And one thing that I came away with when I saw this table for the first time is how wonderful it would have been to be in the four fund strategy rather than the S&P 500 with, that was at the top and at the bottom and in between. I mean, it was all over the place year to year. But then Daryl produced this, K2A. He produced this to give us another way of looking at these in the short term and in the long term. He shows us the best Hager, the compound annualized growth rate, was just owning the S&P 500 by itself, 13.2. And if you had owned it all that time and gotten 13.2, it would have been a wild ride because you would have spent 38% of your, of, of your years in the, the top quintile, the, the top 20%, and you would have spent 25% of your time in the bottom quintile and 38% in between. If you've been in the S&P 500, you would have had a 10% compound rate of return. Now, we've talked about the, the Im implication of an extra half of 1% where you're looking at six times 0.5 difference in between the 10 and the 13.2. That is a meaningful number. What is interesting is the S&P 500 was in first place, the first quintile, 28% of the time. And he in the bottom quintile, 41% of the time. And 31% of the time, you were in the middle, let's call it. But the four-fund strategy, all right, it didn't make 13.2. But it was never in the top, and it was never in the bottom. It was always, in fact, 78% of the time, it was dead in the middle. I shouldn't say dead. It was doing just fine because it had an 11.8% compound rate of return. I have talked to a lot of parents who are trying to figure out what they want to tell their kids they should be doing with their Roth IRAs or their 401ks. If they have lots of choices, what kinds of investments should they make? Well, I'm telling you, at the at not at the top of my list, maybe, but certainly near the top, I would say the four fund strategy, because we're talking about a lot of years that you might pick up an extra 1.8%. Even if they only picked up an extra 1%, it probably means you you, you retire five years earlier. But I want to show you one more of these quilt charts that Daryl put together. And this really is speaking to the combination that I think 
to the to the extent that you're going to have a diversified portfolio. And by the way, the academics tell us today that diversification between different equity asset classes is just as important or maybe more important than the fact that you have 500 stocks instead of 400 stocks. So here are two asset classes we're looking at, and that is the red S&P 500, and what looks like electric blue to me, the small cap value. And notice what is happening between these two. They are kind of at the opposite end of good and bad one year after another, which is excellent. Because now when you have two great equity asset classes that aren't going up and down together all the time, it makes it very impactful to be able to rebalance them. Uh, and what do we find out about the combination of those two? Well, let's just go back a second. The combination of those two, in fact, I've got to go forward instead of backwards. Here's the two fund strategy from 1938 to 47. Well, let's go back to 28 to 37 because that was not a good time to be in the stock market. The four fund strategy lost 2.4% a year. The two fund strategy lost 2.9% a year. The S&P 500 beat them both. It broke even over that particular 10 year period. Then from 1938 to 47, small cap value. In fact, notice in most of the 10 year periods, small cap value is number one. But I want you to notice the two fund strategy here is it is 15.7 the four fund strategy 15.3 it's a pretty good drop down to 9.6 for the S&P 500 and then as it does from time to time it did the best from 48 to 57 i'm talking about the S&P 500 but the two fund strategy was about 2% below it it wasn't a bad 10 years it wasn't the best but you're going to see that that two fund strategy, in most cases, did better than the four fund by a little bit. And if you look over the entire period, from 28 to 23, the two fund strategy compounds at 12 percent, the four fund at 11.8, the S and P 500 at 10. Now, this doesn't promise anything about the future, which is what we what we struggle with. We did see one thing. As a matter of fact, Daryl, would, would you just take a second? And uh, one of our, and I love it when we get questions, Juan wrote to us, and he made the point that it didn't seem right here in this column that says from 2018 to 2023. No, no, no. He was actually looking at the 20-year twenty year period. Oh, the 20-year oh. return. Excuse me. Yeah. Okay, so this is the chart that Juan was referring to. He said, wait a minute. How can the two fund portfolio, which is made up of half S, S, uh, small cap value, SCB, and half the S&P 500, how can it have a better return than either of its two components? The yes, small cap value and the S&P 500. Well, the first thing is, that you have to realize is that this is over it's a 15 year period. So it's not a one year period. In any one year, of course, it cannot do better because it's an average of the performance over that year. But the other thing that you have to remember is that the count, the two fund is made up of small cap value and S&P 500 and those two asset classes will grow at a different rate during uh, the year. They don't have the same returns. And you can see that here on this table here. Uh, every year, they have different returns. Sometimes they're dramatically different, 37 versus 12. Um, but for every one of those individual years, the two fund return is the average of these two. Average of 11.96 and 37.33 is 24.64. So. How do they how do these do when when you how does the two fund do when you put it in a portfolio? Well, this is how it 
how it works. When you put it in a portfolio, you put a thousand dollars in and you let it grow at the end of the year. It's this it starts out next year with the same as, as it, it ended the year before. And we'll talk about why that's important here in a minute. Um, same thing with the small cap value and same thing with the two fund. And down here is what you ended up with when you, after you applied those returns. And when you do the compound annual growth rate calculation, you do indeed get the ones that we had before. So this is this all this shows is the growth of how the the thousand dollars invested would have ended up. So how did the how did how is it possible that the two fund did better over the long term? So we'll look at that in the next chart. And this is how it's possible. It's because the two fund is broken up of an S and P five hundred piece and the small cap value piece. And it's 500, starts out 500 in each one. At the end of the first year, the S&P 500, remember what, that, remember what that return was? Where is it here? Here, it was this return at the end of the first year? Small cap value was that return. So oh, I'm getting way ahead of myself here. Here we go. So at the end of the first year, the S&P 500 had $315 and small cap value had $317. This is a bad year. Okay. Well, in order to be the, that is that with that asset allocation, it's no longer the US two fund because that allocation is not 50 50. If it was, they'd be the same. So, in order to proceed to the next year of returns, you have to even up the starting balances at the beginning of the year. So, it is the US two fund again. And when you do that, you see that they, they have dramatically different growth rates at this particular time. Uh, almost four hundred dollars for the uh, S and P five hundred and four hundred and seventy three for the small cap value. But then again, the next year you have to even it up so that it again meets the definition of the U S two fund, and you do this throughout the entire fifteen year period. So you take and and every year you you move the fund back to your desired asset allocation, which in order to be consistent with the two fund portfolio has to be fifty fifty. And when you do that, you actually do get a higher return. So this is a case where rebalancing or, or maintaining the maintaining truth or true truism to the US2 fund, uh, maintaining the correct asset allocation actually pays off. You actually get a better return. And that is how this can be true. Yes. The two fund can actually outperform its components over time, not in any one year, but over time it can. Yeah. And that's because of rebalancing. And I think it's important for us to add that what we're not showing here is any adjustment for taxation, because for the person who is in the re rebalancing process, uh, actually uh, having to pay taxes on the return that that may turn out not turn out to be as good a deal as it looks there, but th that that is an important thing for people to understand about rebalancing. Well, I think now I have in essence passed the baton to you, Daryl, because because uh, uh, we also have uh, the discussion. As long as you got it, why don't you go ahead and discuss, if you will, your telltale chart? Because I. I think that is another uh, tremendous teaching tool in terms of giving people uh, a better expectation about what the ride uh, is going to look like, particularly if you're putting together some small cap value, for example, uh, with the S&P 500. Okay. Uh, a telltale chart is, is sometimes also called a relative growth chart. And uh, the first time I ever saw it referenced anywhere was in a John Bogle uh, piece back in the early 2000s. That may not have been where it originally came from, but that's the first time I ever saw it. And he referred to it as a telltale chart. I'm not exactly sure why he did that, but that's what it is. So most people, when they think about growth, they think about this kind of a chart. And this is this is an asset, your typical asset class growth chart. 
you put it, and it runs from 1928 through 2023, I think. So you stick a dollar in here at the beginning, and it grows and it grows and it grows and it grows and it grows, and it grows like a typical, with a compound rate of return, it grows in a typical exponential type curve here. Um, we've got, I don't know, four asset classes here and uh, four asset classes, the SP 500 and the, and the total market. Um, but the point is not what these are. The point is that this is a regular growth chart. And so you would say, well, wow, I should have been in that. Look how big that grows. Well, this, and, and they're all kind of choppy, you know? So what does that mean? Well, yeah, the ride was a little rough, but but how do you know whether it was rougher, how does, whether one was rougher than another? And that's, that's where the telltale chart comes in. And what the telltale chart does is you, you pick kind of a, a baseline and, and the ones we're gonna look at, we pick the S&P 500 as the baseline. And you divide, the S&P 500 is down here somewhere. You divide the, the return of, of the, uh, asset class you're looking at and stake small cap growth and, or small cap values since it's up here. And you divide it by the account, by that, that account value by the account value of your baseline, which is the S&P 500. And you do that for every year along the line. And you get a, you get a relative measure of how much they grew during particular interval during one year or whatever, whatever your, your time interval is. And so when we do that for all these different asset classes, we get something that looks like this. So what this means is the, that whenever you divide the performance of the asset class you're interested in by your baseline, which is the S&P 500, uh, how, how much it grew, how much did the S&P 500 grow, and divide that into how much your asset class of interest grew. And that will give you a ratio. This is really a ratio or a relative relative growth uh, here of the asset classes compared both to the S&P 500 value at June of 1927. And of course, when you divide the S&P 500 by the S&P 500, you get one. And so this baseline here, that's this big fat black line is the performance of, or the relative growth of the S&P 500 versus the S&P 500, so that's one. These numbers down here for the long, uh, large cap blend and the total stock market uh, are less than one. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means their growth number that you're dividing by the S&P 500 was less than the S&P 500. If the S&P 500 had grown to 10,000, then these would have grown to roughly 82 or $8,300. So when you divide that by the 10,000 that the S&P grew to, you get a number that's less than one. So if you're below the fat line, you did worse since the start here than the S&P 500. If you're above the fat line, you did better since you started keeping track relative to the S&P 500 uh, back in 1927. So what's happening over here? Well, this is from 1927 to you know, the early to mid 40s. Well, everything kind of did worse than the S&P 500 over that time period. And then after that time period, relative to the original date back here, everything pretty much did better than the S&P 500. The other thing that's interesting in this chart is that you'll see that these lines don't go straight up and down. So when we let's pick a place here, let's look at this one here, since this point here, this is small cap value in the late 90s. So if you remember anything about the 90s, you remember that the S&P 500 was doing pretty well during the 90s. And small cap value relative to the S&P 500 not doing as well. And that's why this line goes down. This number here, I don't know what this number is here. This is about nine, this is about 80, 
or it's about 73 in here. So, so this would have been 7.3 times back to referencing back to the original um, uh, date. Small cap value at this point had grown to 7.3 times the value of the S&P 500. When you get down here, we're at one, two, three, we're about 3.5 or so. So we're about three and a half times the S&P 500. So during this period of time here, if the S&P 500 was Let's just say, for the sake of argument, it's ten thousand dollars. This flat line here represents ten thousand dollars. Your small cap value portfolio would have gone from uh, seventy three thousand dollars down to thirty five thousand dollars. No, oh, that's not good. So what we learn from this is is that as you move right in time, when the lines are going down here and here and here and here. And here, your account is losing value relative to the S&P 500. The other thing to remember is that the number that you're actually at is highly positive. So when you go back, or highly greater than one, and so when you go back and compare it to the beginning over the last 96 years or so, your, your account, even though it has experienced a, a decrease here, has grown in this point here, 10 times as much as the S&P 500 did. So just like when lines are sloping down to the right, when they go up to the right, that means the small cap value, in this case, this blue line, is outperforming or is growing faster than the S&P 500. Here it was growing slower than the S&P 500. Here it's growing faster than the S&P 500. So across from here to here, on a normal growth chart, if you have two points that have the same value, and say you didn't have any growth, well, that's not true. What, you, what this means here is that across from here, from here to say 83 to whatever that is, 99, 2000, you had the same relative growth. This is about seven. Seven times here by 83, you had grown seven times as much as the S&P 500, and you had grown seven times as much as the S&P 500 here by 2000. Like. So even though in a, in a uh, telltale chart format, you, grew a, you, you are no better off relative to the S&P 500 than you were 15 years earlier or so, that sounds like that's not a good thing. But what that really means is you did just as well as the S&P 500. You didn't, you didn't maintain or do worse. You did just as well. So whatever the S&P 500 did here, you got the same, same return, same growth and growth, relative growth during this period here in a ratio, in a relative sense, ratio sense. So whatever the S&P 500 grew to here, was here in 83, seven times as much, whatever it was here in 2000, you're still seven times as much. So that's a, that's a, a telltale, what the telltale chart or relative growth chart means. So what is this good for? To me, what this tells you is that it tells you over time how asset classes typically perform because they they all set for the most part, have uh, these three asset classes and the four fund is in here too. It's kind of this brown color here. Um, they tend to outperform over time. They tend to outperform uh, the, the S&P 500. And there are long periods of time along these kind of relatively flat periods in here where they don't outperform, but they perform the same as, roughly, the S&P 500. So, but there are choppy times in here too. So uh, when, when, you, when you do, it depends on when you get in. So if you got in here, you experienced some great growth. If you got in here, you experienced a decrease to begin with. So they give you, they give you an idea about how 
um, how the ride has been, how the relative ride has been. If the S&P is considered a smooth ride, then the others are choppier, with the exception of some of these down here, maybe. And, you know, Daryl, the thing that to me is the warning, uh, as much as I like small cap value, I think when people are going to be attracted to it is after it's been on a terror and doing well. Yeah. And if that's what people are going to do, Here. if they're going to chase performance, Here. and 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 then the next thing that happens is for the next 15 to 20 years, it performs okay, but not better. I mean, this is the part that people need to understand, I think, is that there will be many long periods that small cap value performs well, but not better. And so uh, it, it is something that you invest in if you want to do better for the long term, not thinking that immediately you're going to, 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 to be capturing uh, premium results. It takes time. And not everybody has the patience to, to let that happen. Yeah, and there's also there's also a, a certain degree of, you know, a lot of it depends on when you choose to invest or when you can afford to invest. So we've talked before about how the, uh, there's there's an element of luck in this whole process. And so if you if you if you invested here, then you experienced a decrease to begin with. If you invested here, just a few years later, you experienced an increase to begin with. So that's kind of the luck aspect. And, and of I, it. And I um, think it's, excuse me, I'm sorry. No. I think it's important to people understand when that number, when that graph is going down, it doesn't mean you're not making money. It's just, it's the relative return to the S&P 500. It's underperforming. So right. the S&P 500 could be up 20% and small cap value could be up 10 it's still okay to be up ten, but it wouldn't it be better to be up twenty? And you got to you you've you've just got to understand that there are times when the S and P is going to be a better performer. Yeah, and the good news is nobody invests a dollar in June nineteen twenty seven and leaves it there for ninety six years. So what what a real investor will do, the most typical investor will do, is they invest a little bit as they go along. And so when you look at the next chart here, let me go here. That's what this green line is here. This is when you start out and you invest periodically the same amount every, every, every interval, every year. So you start here and you have an investment. And, and if, you re, if you see here, this is the small cap value in blue and then the dollar cost averaging into small cap value is in green. So if you remember when you, if you look at it here, small cap value went way down. This is down what? Let's see, this is 10, 20, 30. So it went down 60 some percent in the in the five first five years here. But what happened to the dollar cost averager? He didn't go down, she didn't go down nearly as much. Went down, I don't know, 50% maybe or 40%. That doesn't sound good, but it's a lot better than being down 60 or 70 percent. And so uh, that's one of the things. And then when it does start to come back relative to the S&P 500 here, when it starts to come back. Oh, by the way, this is now the S&P 500 is investing the same amount periodically also to get the growth value for the seven for the S&P 500. So by the time the five, six years is over again, now, uh, first five or six years is over by dollar cost averaging in, you're now on the plus side right here, relative to the S&P 500, where the lump sum investor is not. Um, and this is what Chris has said a lot of times when he talks about the two fund portfolio is that periodic investing reduces your downside risk early on because you don't notice the downs, the down draw, the drawdowns as much. So this is what dollar cost averaging can do for you. And over the period of 96 years, um, this is in, in, in investing periodically increases your return by almost a factor of two, if you look at it. Not quite, but almost. So whatever um, the S&P. Relative to the S&P. 
So, yeah. So if the S and P 500 at the end of this period of time had grown to a hundred thousand dollars on a lump sum basis, it would have grown to 12.76 times that on a dollar cost averaging basis, it would have grown to 23.12 times that. So, uh, that's a decided advantage, but it did take right. time. Well, yes. Daryl, I, I appreciate that. Is there anything else that you want to add to the to the telltale discussion? Well, I think there, we talked about how long you have to wait, maybe to come back or to or to go through the the break even or or the downsides. Yep. And this is why we always look at returns over twenty year periods. Um, because you don't want to be chasing returns year to year, and you and you, to, in order to see the benefit of a lot of the small, at least in the past, relative to the S and P five hundred, to see the benefit of the growth, you've had to wait decades in case. In sometimes doesn't mean that you're doing bad. It just means you're not doing better. You're not seeing the premium yet. So that's, I guess, that's all I had. So let me just make sure that they that, that there's a seventeen year six month period that you break even there's a i mean break even with the s p there's a 19 year period there's a there's a almost eight year period there's another 17 year period there's another 18 year period yeah those are before you get back to before you get back to where you were yeah. relative to the s p 500 yeah. and then started to do better right it's well, there's almost a 35 year period way back yes. at the beginning yes. if you if you yes. look at june of 1962 yeah, all the way out to here yeah, yeah. yep that's yeah right. that's that's great now the good news is the good news is like we talked about for the dollar cost averager they're buying at a discount for the first 5 10 15 17 or 18 years out of that so which is what you want to do relative to the s p 500 Anyway, that's all right, Chris. You're you are up. I'm I'm up. And do I remember right? Your question, Paul, is what what is what is the one chart? If I can only pick one chart, yeah, that I think is most instructive to our audience of investors. Is that right? Yes. Or or if we had to pick three, <laughs> what would the third one be? All right. Well, I'm gonna. I love your fine tuning, your two funds for life fine tuning table. That is my one chart. So let me yeah. share it. Yeah. <laughs> you need mode. to hit the little button down here on the lower right. You want know, presentation yeah. mode? Yeah. Like that. There you go. Now you're happy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I made Daryl happy. Yay. <laughs> you always <laughs> make me happy, Chris. <clears throat> All right. So why why do I think this, if I was only going to share one chart with somebody, why do I think this is the best chart? Well, it, it, it describes not just the equity portfolio that you're picking and how tilted it is to small in value, but it also includes bonds. It includes fixed income. And we know that people, as they go through their life, are going to have to grapple with not just their equity allocation, but they're also going to have to grapple with their fixed income allocation. And we also know that when you combine equities, whether they be large, small, value, blend, when you combine those with fixed income, you get another level of diversification, and that can help improve your return per unit of risk. So this chart lets you see all of that, and it lets you see for all of those variables, metrics that matter to the accumulator in terms of their best 10 or their, their nominal or expected 10-year compound annual rate of return, their worst 10-year rate of return, their variability of the rate of return, the worst drawdown we see, as well as for retirees, the resilience to sequence of returns risk, which is indicated here as safe withdrawal rate. So it's got a little bit of something for everyone. It's got something for the accumulator. It's got something for the retiree. 
and it explores the space fairly thoroughly. And, and basically what's on the chart are various two fun for life combinations. And the, the way you read it is across the top, you have the vintage of the target date fund and it's expressed either in years to retirement. So you've got 25 years or more for retirement. So uh, today that would be like a, let's see, if you had 25 to say we're in 2025, that'd be a 2050 fund or later or 20 years to retirement, 15 years to retirement, 10, five, zero, or all the way into retirement, seven years into retirement. So underneath those vintages, I have the approximate allocation for something very much like a Vanguard target date fund. Basically you get some US stocks, some international stocks, no tilt to small, no tilt to value, and then some bonds. And then going down the chart over on the left-hand side, you can combine with 0% small cap value, 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%. -50%. And you can see when you do that combination, what the historical back test for a lump sum investment did. Going back to 1970 in the case of the returns, going back to 1928 for the safe withdrawal rate. And I, I just think, if I could only give somebody one chart, how else can I show them what they're likely to get when they mix their equities and their fixed income and tilt towards small in value? This, this is the only place to do that. And for somebody who's interested, um, they can also look at the allocations. I've calculated those out and they could implement this with target date funds, with index funds. They could implement it with balanced funds or with lifestyle funds. There's a lot of different ways you could do it with only four funds or only two funds. So lots of very simple implementations. And how would I imagine somebody using this chart? Well, I would imagine them first of all, starting out by maybe scanning it and looking at how things vary across the chart, but then deciding what's important to them. You know, do they care most about the compound annual rate of return and not so much about the worst case drawdown because they know they're going to be really good at looking away? Or are they a retiree who cares more about the resilient sequence of returns risk and they care mostly about the safe wall rate? Or do they the highest return per unit of risk? And they can use this chart and go and look for those things. And here, you know, here are examples. You could go and look for where the compound annual rate of return is above 11%. You could look for where the peak to trough loss was less than 40%. And you could find the combinations that gave you that. You could look for where the safe withdrawal rate was greater than 4.4%. So, 10% better than the historically prudent 4% safe withdrawal rate. Or you could look for all of those things and you could get this combination in the bottom right hand corner that is not reflected in any of the previous charts we looked at because it's a barbell. It gets its diversification from a combination of the fixed income, the tilt to small, the tilt to value and the equities. So I think this is the the one chart I would go to because if I'm thinking about some kind of an allocation in one of my accounts and I want to keep my implementation simple, let's say I'm looking at a an inherited IRA and I've I want it to have the ability to generate high returns with relatively low volatility and have a great resilience to sequence of returns risk because I'm going to have to take money out of every out of it every year because there's required minimum withdrawals. I might really like this bottom right hand corner. I might decide, well, I'm going to do a 50-50 combination of a Vanguard target income fund, which is a 2015 target date fund effectively, and a US small cap value and I'm going to have a very high likelihood that that balance stays healthy throughout my lifetime and lets me continue to take a large number of healthy withdrawals out of it without having to take a lot of money out in a year when it's down because it was too volatile. Um, so 
that, that, that might be one way to use it. So for me, if I'm only going to pick one chart to help people understand the widest amount of information about how they might simply implement a broadly diversified portfolio to achieve their objectives, this would be it. So, Chris, you've done a number of presentations to AAII organizations, uh, and it includes this discussion that you just went through, but goes beyond with, with discussion about the target date fund. Do you have a one of them that particularly, uh, whether it was Puget Sound or Orange County, or is there one that you felt was was the the best ex extended presentation because uh, I think we might want to when they're when they're available and they're neither one of those are available yet but uh, is there one that you would want us to be pointing to? Well, if you're interested in something that dives specifically deeply on two funds for life and spends time on this chart, I'd probably go to the boot camp video that we have on the website. Ah, right, right, right. Of course. Of course. Because that does end up talking about this. But yeah. it, an upcoming presentation, I don't know when it'll be, um, but uh, possibly in the fall with you, it looks like we might have an opportunity to do something. Uh, I have thought I might build that entire presentation around two funds for life in this chart and show how somebody could create a glide path for themselves out uh, of this chart. Oh, great. Because you could, for example, decide in, you know, your early years, you want to be 50, 50 combo, 50% 50 U S small cap value, 50% target date fund, but that that's uncomfortable for retirement. Uh, and instead, what you want to do is maybe kind of ease your way up towards one of these 17% uncertainty boxes for your, your balance uncertainty approaching retirement. And then you could decide how you were going to do that going across the chart. So you might decide that, you know, by the time you're 15 years out from retirement, you want to be 40% small cap value and 10 years out from retirement, 30% small cap value, five years out from retirement, 20% small cap value. And then in retirement, you know, go with that 10% small cap value. So you could decide that you want to navigate through this chart like that. And as long as you're in a tax deferred account, you could, you could then, you know, very easily implement it without incurring a lot of additional taxes really? and control your ride and customize it and and uh, and get to a really interesting customized solution. That's and I think that date is November 16th. Uh, it That's is correct. The Los Angeles AAII and uh, Chris and I are going to do a 75 minute piece as hot as that sounds. I'll give you more of the 75 than I'll take. Uh, and because uh, that's a that'll be a great presentation. That's super. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you both very much. Uh, we gave them a lot of information, and uh, I, you know, my my sense is those that are struggling with some big decisions might uh, dig in. Maybe they'll watch this a couple times. Uh, I think it'll be a difficult podcast to listen to. But uh, we will provide uh, the uh, the links to what it is that we showed uh, so that you can uh, print those out for yourself. I appreciate all your work, you guys. You're, you are uh, you are jewels and and I just want you to know I hear virtually every day I appreciate the, the appreciation people have for what you're doing. Thank you. And thanks to all of you who are listening and to all of those who pass this information along. All the best to all of you. Bye-bye.